Okay, so last time we did a, a quick survey of the solar system just to see what is ahead for us. And today I want f to look first at some of the regularities in the planetary motions. And the three most important ones were discovered by Johannes Kepler in the early 1600s, uh, formulated in uh, his three laws of planetary motion. And the first law describes the shape of a uh, planet's orbit. It's elliptical. Uh, ellipse is uh, a deformed circle, but it's actually quite precisely defined curve as illustrated here. Uh, to construct it, uh, you can use two uh, thumbtacks and pin them down, string a slack piece of rope between them, tie them to both, then make string taut with the pencil and just keep moving the pencil while keeping the string taut, right? And as a result, you would get this shape here, which is an ellipse. And the property of this curve that for any point along the ellipse, the sum of their distances from these two fixed points so-called foci is always the same, right? And ellipse has two uh, axes, the longer one and uh, so-called major axis and the shorter one, uh, minor axis. And it's common to denote a half of the uh, major axis or semi-major axis with A. And then the eccentricity of uh, an ellipse, that is the parameter that specifies how much it differs from the circle, is defined here. Basically, eccentricity is the ratio of the distance of one of the two foci from the center of the ellipse and the semi-major axis. Or another way around uh, would be to say that the distance uh, of, uh, of either one of the two foci from the center of the ellipse is obtained by multiplying the length of the semi-major axis with this number uh, uh, that uh, represents the eccentricity. So if eccentricity was zero, then basically the two foci would uh, coincide with the center of the ellipse and you would get a perfect circle. And then as eccentricity increases from zero, the curve it starts deviating more and more uh, from perfect circle. And this number is always between zero and one. Uh, now, what are the eccentricities of planetary orbits? Well, it turns out that except for planet Mercury, which has eccentricity of about 21%, the eccentricities of remaining seven planets are less than 10%, okay? So they deviate uh, by a small amount from a perfect circle, as you can see uh, from this diagram here. So you can see here's the sun at the center. Here is the orbit of Mercury. Uh, it's, it has fairly high eccentricity of 21%. But the other planets, Venus, has an eccentricity that is 0.7%, uh, right? About 1%. The Earth is 1.7%, less than 2% here. And Mars is uh, higher. It's 9%, but it's still less than 10%. And just for comparison, what is drawn here are the orbits of one of uh, Apollo asteroids. Remember, those are the asteroids that cross the Earth's orbit and potentially can be a danger to us. So here is uh, uh, this Icarus Apollo asteroid. That's his uh, orbit. It takes about a year for it to complete one revolution. It's, it's, uh, its orbit is highly elliptical. Uh, the eccentricity is 83%. And then, this is part of the orbit of a well-known comet, Halley's Comet, that has a period of about 75 years. It's, it comes along every 75 years. 
and this is just part of its orbit. Uh, 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 you see it actually comes, uh, passes uh, uh, inside, uh, near the sun, inside the Mercury's orbit, and its eccentricity is almost 97%, okay? So that you can see here what uh, different bodies, what, their, um, what the eccentricities of their orbits are. But for planets, except for Mercury, the one that is closest to the sun, uh, the eccentricities for remaining seven are less than uh, 10%. Uh, the second uh, observation is that uh, the solar system is essentially flat. That is, the orbital planes of all planets uh, nearly coincide with the Earth's orbital plane or ecliptic. Here's a schematic diagram illustrating the Earth's orbital plane around the Sun. As you can see, as those of you who took Astronomy 1, PO1 will remember, uh, over the period of time, at least for several centuries, uh, the direction of uh, the Earth's rotational axis remains fixed in space, and that's why we have seasons. Uh, it's tilted at 23 degrees. So this is the ecliptic, and the following diagram illustrates the so-called angles of inclination of orbital plane, orbital planes of other planets. So imagine that we are looking edge-on at this ecliptic, of course, uh, the inclination angle for uh, the Earth is zero because it's, we measure uh, the angles of orbital planes of other planets relative to that of the Earth. So you can see that uh, it's fairly high for uh, Mercury, seven degrees, but still less than uh, uh, 10 degrees. Uh, for Venus, it's uh, just over three degrees, Saturn, uh, over two degrees, for Mars, one and a half, or so, almost two degrees, I'm sorry. Um, Neptune, uh, almost two degrees, and Jupiter, close to just one degree, right? And for Uranus, it's very small. So the conclusion is, of course, Pluto, this diagram is probably from the time where uh, students were taught that there are nine planets, uh, but we now know that Pluto is ca categorized in separate uh, uh, category of dwarf planet, uh, its inclination angle is quite high, right? But for eight planets, the inclination angle is less than 10 degrees, and we conclude that the entire solar system is flat. Next, just like the Earth uh, uh, orbits the Sun in the counterclockwise direction, as seen from above uh, the Earth's North Pole, all the other planets do the same thing. They all revolve around uh, the sun in the counterclockwise, or as it is often said, prograde uh, uh, direction. And it turns out that the sun itself spins in that counterclockwise direction. Moreover, if you look at the motion of the satellites of various planets in the solar system, nearly all large satellites orbit their respective planets in a counterclockwise direction. Moreover, nearly all of the planets uh, 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 spin around uh, a spin axis in the counterclockwise direction. Uh, the exceptions are uh, Uranus and Venus. Okay. So uh, this line here, it's a, a direction perpendicular to the ecliptic, okay? And this line is the uh, spin axis of a planet, right? So to uh, get uh, the direction of the spin axis, uh, then curl the fingers of your right hand uh, in the direction which the planet is orbiting, and then the direction of your thumb will give you uh, uh, the direction of the spin axis. So as those of you who took uh, Astronomy 1PO1 
Well, remember that this angle, tilt angle or obliquity, uh, for the Earth is 23 and a half degrees, and it maintains that tilt at, at least for several centuries, maybe a millennium. And that's why we have seasons. Right? Now, in the case of Uranus, see, I would have to, if I'm following with the curled fingers of my right hand, if I'm following uh, the direction of rotation of Uranus, then the my thumb is pointing this way, so the uh, tilt angle is almost 100 degrees. The uh, rotational axis of Uranus is uh, close to being perpendicular to this direction, perpendicular to the ecliptic. And in the case of Venus, this angle is nearly 180 degrees. It's upside down, almost. And the question is why? And uh, the reason uh, is not completely understood, but one thing is known, and that is that if a planet has a satellite of substantial size, like our Earth has, it has a moon, right? then that uh, satellite uh, stabilizes the direction of its rotational axis. It stabilizes uh, the Earth's um, obliquity varies maybe over time uh, by at most a degree, one way or the other, right? It's fairly stable. But Venus, on the other hand, has no satellites, as we saw. And then it could happen that all of a sudden Although the Venus might have initially had its rotational axis pointing uh, at some not too big angle relative to the perpendicular to the ecliptic, it, the instability could develop because it has no satellites and it, that angle can move to being nearly 180 degrees. Again, not only the planets, but nearly all large satellites have this counterclockwise spin. There are exceptions. Uh, the two satellites of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, Fear and Terror, uh, they do not have a counterclockwise spin, but they are not like the satellites of other planets, including uh, the Earth satellite Moon. Uh, they are most likely captured asteroids. You will recall that the asteroid belt is the region uh, between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And it is possible that either due to Jupiter's gravitational force or interaction between the asteroids themselves, some of them get kicked to the inner part of the solar system. And then if Mars could uh, capture those bodies. So to support that idea that they are likely captured asteroids, I'm showing here uh, photographs of these two, they're quite small in size, a few kilometers across, of these two satellites of uh, uh, Mars, right? And here is the photo of well-known asteroid uh, Gaspar. Okay? So you see that they are basically uh, bodies of the same type. So it is nearly certain that Deimos and Phobos are uh, captured asteroids. And also all satellites of Uranus don't have that property, but as you saw uh, uh, earlier, the Uranus itself, it has um, its rotational axis at almost 100 degrees relative to the per perpendicular uh, to the ecliptic. So from all these points where we discussed that there is, uh, you know, uh, the, there is overwhelming counterclockwise rotation or spin, uh, we can conclude that there is a very definite counterclockwise um, twist in uh, uh, our solar system. The second Kepler's law that I didn't highlight here tells us something uh, about how the speed of the planet changes as it revolves around the sun. As it turns out, the most important thing is that a planet moves fastest when it's close to the sun and it's 
its speed is lowest when it is at the greatest distance from the sun. The third Kepler's law relates essentially, strictly speaking, uh, the size of the semi-major axis and the orbital period. Uh, and it says that if you express the size of the semi-major axis in astronomical units and orbital uh, period in years, in year, Earth's year, then this ratio of the third power of the semi-major axis over period squared is one. But we can also think, although it's not quite uh, the same thing, uh, that we could use here because the deviations of distances of a planet from the sun are quite small, right? Eccentricities, except for Mercury, are less than 10%. We can try and work with the average distance here. So let's see what happens. Uh, here is the list of planets. Their average distance from the sun in astronomical units, orbital period in year. And then I've calculated the value of this ratio, the average distance cubed of the, the period squared. And you can see that basically in all cases except the biggest error is uh, for Mercury whose um, eccentricity is 21%, and that's the reason why I should have been using, or one should use, the size of semi-major axis instead of the average distance of a planet from the sun. Uh, that, indeed, this is equal to one. But one thing that is implied by the third Kepler's law that I want you uh, to remember is, and it's basically saying that as uh, the distance of a planet from the sun increases, so must the orbital period, so that this ratio remains constant. If I increase A, the distance from the sun, its orbital period also has to increase. And you can see that here, right? That um, uh, orbital period for Mercury is about a quarter of the year. For Venus, it's 60%. For Earth, it's 1%. Uh, for Mars, it's uh, about 1.9 years. For Jupiter, it's 12 years. It takes 12 years uh, for Jupiter to revolve around the sun once. For Saturn, for Saturn it's uh, 29 uh, uh, and a half years. And I guess that's longer than any uh, one of you, uh, most of you have been around, right? Uh, so uh, in your lifetime, the Saturn did not make a complete orbit around the sun. For Uranus, it's 84 years, okay? I haven't lived long uh, for uh, Uranus to make one full orbit. And for Neptune, at 30 astronomical units, the orbital period is 164, 165 years almost, okay? So no human being uh, can live that long. So I think it's important for you to have some kind of sense for how long it takes these different uh, planets to revolve around the sun. Okay, so as I here highlighted that fact that as the average distance from the sun goes up, so does the orbital period.